Well, we, we will um, now move on to our final session, which is, we've called it uh, Representing Black Women. Um, we, uh, uh, Jordan Harris, who was going to be presenting on Mary Seacombe, has had to, uh, to pull out. So we have, we have two speakers. Um, and um, uh, Pinto, who we're delighted to have with us from Austin, Texas. Uh, welcome. Um, it's great. And uh, Jeff Barasox from slightly closer to home, um, UCL. Um, and so, and the session is going to be chaired by Joanna Brown from the Royal Africa Society. Um, so I will hand over to Joanna now to... Brilliant. Thank you, Philip. Um, so a very warm welcome to um, everybody. Obviously, the advantage of us being online for this edition is that we can welcome people from all around the globe, which is very exciting. Um, so yes, um, as Philip said, we'll have um, two speakers for this session. Um, we've got Samantha Pinto from the University of Texas at Austin and Jeff Bowersox from UCL. Um, and um, I'll introduce um, Jeff in a bit more detail when we come to his presentation. Um, so I'll just quickly give you um, some housekeeping. If, if you're wanting to tweet about the session, during the session you can use the hashtag that's at the top of the chat, at BlackBritHist. Um, as Miranda has said, if you'd like to share um, any links to your own projects and research, please do so in the chat. Um, and we'll continue to use the chat function for uh, questions in the Q&A. So do please keep posting your questions there um, and I'll pick those up at the end of the presentation. Um, so, our first presentation is um, Girl Ship, Challenging Geographical, Historical and Formal Historical Methods in Black British Studies from Samantha Pinto. Samantha is Associate Professor of English at the University of Texas at Austin. And very, very warm welcome to you, Samantha, uh, and over to you. And just let me know if you want me to um, share slides. If you're happy sharing your own, that's absolutely fine. Let me know if you if you want me to take over. I think I should be able, oh, did I unmute? I did. Uh, I think I should be able to do it. I want to um, thank you all for welcoming me today. First of all, from Austin, Texas. Um, second of all, it is very likely that either my five or my seven-year-old will barge in at a certain point if we can all just go with that. Um, thank you in advance. Um, and I just put a, um, a link since Mary Siegel won't be talking, I won't be spoken about today. I just put a link to something I just published on Art UK that is along the lines of what I'm talking about today with art history. Um, not that I really know anything, but it, it might be interesting to see. So I'm going to um, go ahead and share my screen so that you guys can see slides and less of me, I hope. Um, and I'm, I will hit present mode, sorry that you're getting this. Wonderful, okay, so um, can everyone see it? Yes, the slides, okay, great. So, um, uh, and I, I teach at 11 my time, which is five this time. So if I run out at the tail end, you'll know why. Um, I'm going to, th this is drawn from research that I did for my book uh, on Sarah Forbes Bonetta, but I'm going to talk, uh, I constructed something different here. So I'm not reading and I'm not reading from my book as much as I am trying to um, sort of think of, think through from an art historical lens, what it means to do the visual history of Black British studies. Um, so I'm gonna start with um, why I call this girl ship, right? So Christina Sharp, uh, a, 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 an African-American studies and, and also located in Canada, which is an interesting um, uh, uh, intersection at this point uh, in her book, In the Wake, has a chapter called How a Girl Becomes a Ship, where she speaks about this photograph. Um, uh, by David Gilkey for NPR after the Haitian earthquake of 2010. Um, and she uses this to think about, um, and in the case of her book, very particularly Phyllis Wheatley being named for the ship that she came on, the Phyllis, right? And this is the case with Sarah Forbes Bonetta as well. Forbes is Frederick Forbes, the naval officer, but the Bonetta is his ship. 
right? Um, when he, uh, in this case, Phyllis Wheatley came, um, was kidnapped through the middle passage. Uh, the, the lore of Sarah Forbes Bonetta is that um, she was a, a gift. Uh, she was uh, uh, kidnapped from her home, rumored to be a princess, which we'll hear about, um, and uh, by the King of Benin, who, um, King Gezo, who was a um, involved and became powerful and rich from the slave trade. And then, of course, um, Britain outlawed it. And then it was trying to change its moral code to be, and that's why the Navy was there to try to say, oh, no, 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 we don't agree with the slave trade, but we still want trade. Um, and uh, Bonetta, Sarah Forbes Bonetta uh, was someone who Forbes, in his account, right, uh, rescued slash got as a gift uh, and then became Queen Victoria's goddaughter. And that is how she exists, right, in the frame. So girl ship this conflation, right, of, of Black girlhood and um, the ships, right, that, um, and the various transit and uh, trade and Black lives um, that was happening at the time. Um, it's also, uh, Sharp's book, right, is also about um, the problem of Black objectification in visual uh, culture. And the question of the black gaze or the possibility of what theorist Tina Kamp calls black refusal. Um, and that theorist Nicole Fleetwood speaks about as the problem of representation in black studies as both the site of injury and also the site we're looking to for cure, right? And we could hear this today in the um, inspiring ways that people are thinking about bringing Black British history into the national curriculum, right? And also the ways that um, even as we see the, the good work that that does, um, it can also offer other problematic lenses on Black life, right? And so that's what we're, the, I, the sort of problem that occupies in particular African-American studies. Um, so this sort of paradox of representation as the injury and the cure, I'm particularly interested in exploring through art and art history um, and asking what's different when you do Black British history through art history and through the history of art and the visual, where can it take us? What are the limits of visual history? What are the possibilities of it? Um, and can we get to what theorist Sadia Hartman calls critical fabulation, which is a way of thinking about um, how to take um, these violent archives that mark um, and visualize Black life taken from a colonial perspective largely um, and, and the perspective of enslavement, can we make them into something else through art? Um, and, and also how do the subjects within these art frames um, either speak back or speak to um, these um, violences of the archive. So uh, early visual myths of Sarah Forbes Bonetta. This is a portrait by Octavius Oakley, uh, which uh, was painted a few years after um, Bonetta actually came to the UK and became the goddaughter of Queen Victoria, uh, subtitled the Dahomean Captive. Uh, you can see that this has um, a lot of the uh, markers of uh, othering, right, and, ex and making exotic uh, African cultures that are happening at the time. So there's um, tons of visual markers of um, of uh, what we might call cultural difference, right? Um, that are happening to sort of trade in Bonetta's identity, right? And who she is and what she represents and what it means that Queen Victoria has, a, has adopted her, right? Has taken her in. Um, folks who have done work in this period of Victorian art include Caroline Bressy, Jen Marsh, Gwendolyn Shaw, to try to kind of collect the various of um, of Black Victorians is, is what most of their work, uh, how it's grouped, right? Um, how 
how black subjects are represented in Victorian art, right? This is part of it, but we'll see some other parts too, because her um, Sarah Forbes Bonetta's carte de visites are through this as well. So early visual myths of of Bonetta sort of cue towards this. And then we get uh, her at 13, um, photographed by William Bambridge. And this is something we'll note. Um, Bambridge uh, got a start as a missionary in New Zealand and is now considered one of the pioneers of photographic process. Um, and we'll see, and, and again, I use pioneers in quotes because that the, the, the process of colonization, the various forms that it took and technology, like the technology of photographic process are, are greatly entwined, right? And there's a, there's a book about this that's actually about modernism called Savage Preservation by Brian Hockman. Um, that's really great. That's again about the modernist period, but still sort of about how um, this drive to record um, and sort of colonize racial difference drives technologies. Um, so Bambridge um, uh, becomes a royal photographer um, and photography at this point, uh, a few people set up shop and being uh, we'll see with Camille Sylvie, the next person I'll talk about, royal and celebrity portraiture is um, the big business uh, of the time. Uh, and they and from there, uh, folks create these carte de visites, which shows that they've got social cachet, right, and that you would like to see their social cachet. Um, and then that's pitted against these very high social modes of engagement with the visual are, um, are undergirded, right? By these proto anthropological developments and uses of technology, right? Of developing photographic process for Bambridge that was um, trying to photograph the Maori in New Zealand. Um, so thinking about how racial difference is um, translating in the technical form of the photograph here. Um, in this photograph, you can see that there's, um, uh, they're, they're trying to signal uh, visual markers of assimilation into British culture uh, and, and of course, right? Um, I'm not saying anything about Bonetta's authentic identity um, any more than the Octavius Oakley portrait is authentic. This portrait um, shows a 13 year old girl living in Victorian England in Victorian dress, right? That makes total sense. Um, but uh, the earrings and other things also kind of mark that, um, that, uh, there's still some holding on, right, to some um, personal identity, right, and to some uh, identities that come before um, the Forbes um, uh, brings her over, right, to the UK. Um, and then the other thing to note about this, because we have to keep noting it, because it's going to come up in all of the rewrites of this portraiture, the gaze here, right, the look on the face, um, again, this isn't about authenticating what Bonetta was feeling, right? One can't know what she's feeling, but the artists, the contemporary artists who rewrite this are going to really look at and try to play with this idea of what it, what is this gaze that looks, um, and this will be very different than the next set of portraits, that looks still vulnerable, still um uh, not yet hailed into um, the heroism or the iconic status of being the goddaughter, right, of Queen Victoria, the, the African goddaughter, right? We, we, we see that this is a moment of transition, and I think that that's really uh, important. Uh, I also should note that, as other folks have noted, um, Black Victorians were actually um, very, very common sites, right, in London at the time. And so a lot of times when these photographs are recovered, um, uh, because that history has been so whitewashed, a lot of contemporary viewers see the Victorian dress as the sort of like Barthian um, punctum, right, that that says, oh, there is, you know, an African, a Black African identity here and Victorian dress kind of does not compute, right, does not go together, when in fact, um, as 
all of you know, um, it it was at this era um, not uncommon in London, right, to see Black Londoners. And so thinking about how that works and Gretchen Grazina's work uh, is, is key there for some of that. Um, and then um, thinking about, I'll switch to the next photograph. These are the photographs of, um, of, so this is just, you know, six years later, this is when um, Sarah Forbes Bonetta is getting married. These are done by Camille Sylvie, a French diplomat. So again, you've got this issue of kind of colonial travel going on. Um, he's a French diplomat who also becomes a pioneer of photographic process. Um, later in his life, um, he, he is, uh, he does one of the first panorama pictures. He figures out how to do war photography, uh, which is very important for the Crimea, right? Um, uh, just before this, right? Um, uh, so he is, a, again, a sort of pioneer as well. Um, this is her during her um, marriage portraits. Um, we know from letters, extant letters, that um, Bonetta did not want to marry the person that she married, uh, who was um, a, an upper class Nigerian um, businessman. Uh, he was widowed, he was much older than her. And basically Queen Victoria was like, this is what you need to do, get it together, right? I'm being very off the cuff here. Oh, my sharing was paused. I can still see it. Oh, okay. I'm going to resume. I don't know what happened. Okay. So, um, so anyway, um, uh, she, um, here we've got this gaze looking out that again, without going into authenticity about how she's feeling, um, appears much more direct and confident, right? This is an adult, but also resigned, right? Resigned to what's going on. Um, and then you've got the appearance of self-sovereignty. And this is what I'm interested in my book chapter that I'm giving you less of today, right? In an image of capture, right? So here she is captured in a marriage, sort of captured in the photograph, but you've got this appearance, uh, again, of self-sovereignty. Um, and there's more of these photographs, right? Here's her in an ornate and posed way of working. Um, you've got um, a mark of class. This is my son, Finn. Hi, everyone. Um, you've got uh, the mark of her class and social standing um, with the backdrop right, that's happening, and the dress, this is her wedding dress, of course, and you've also got, it's very clear that she's a celebrity, these will be circulated, these will be given as calling cards, her wedding is covered in the, in the press of the time, uh, and it's, it's a big event, right, she is a member of the royal family. So then you've got, um, this is another wedding portrait with um, James Davies, her husband, um, so I want to speak a little bit about Heather Ajipong's um, Too Many Blackamores series, where she rewrites this um, these series of carte de visites. As you can see here, and I'm sorry, the quality is uh, not great from the images I lifted off the internet, but um, uh, you've got this, um, instead the, punct the punctum here is a drape, right, over the face, a refusal to look, but also... Um, a recreation of black portraiture. Um, so Richard Powell, the art historian, uh, calls black portraiture a cutting figure, right? So thinking about assertion of selfhood, right? Even within capture, even when you're not in charge of making the photograph. Um, but also here with um, Aggie Pong's um, reimagining of it, right? Thinking of an allowance, not just for the heroic, tragic binary, the pole, but for a a gaze or a refusal of a gaze that allows for vulnerability um, and for affective complexity um, that's defined not just through injury. And you could see that more here, right? Um, stages of what might be called vanity, right? Stages of um, sadness, a sort of uh, a, a, a more um, traditionally like resistant looking back, obviously with anachronistic shoes, right? There's moments where um, uh, Aggie Pong is reading a book, right? There's moments where um, staged as Bonetta, she's looking at um, a kinte cloth on a chair, right? So this is not trying to be historically accurate as much as it's trying to say, 
how do we write the biographies of these figures? How do we re rewrite them as they are recovered to be complex and not just heroic or tragic? Um, and that's really the polls that we're kind of looking at. So refusal, um, but also a range that shows the inability to refuse and what I call the refusal to refuse the gaze, right? So not feeling like, um, and she talks about this, the artist a lot, not feeling like one has to be always um, this stereotype of sort of like a strong black woman, right? And being able to contest that. Um, I just wanna run through a few other contemporary images of, um, Sarah Forbes Bonetta, Hannah Uzer. Um, this is brand new. It just went up, uh, sponsored by um, English Heritage Sites, uh, a new portrait. Uh, you can see the, again, the investments in Black British history and looking back, right, and the recovery of Black um, uh, images, but also of Black agency. This is over um, in the Osborne House at the Isle of Wight, where Victoria sometimes stayed with her children, right? And so this is um, a reflection of that and, and more black portraiture is supposed to follow, right? We could think about what that means. Um, we've got um, a white Dutch artist, um, Dagmar van Wiegel, who um, does mostly work on black women and portraiture of black women. Uh, in this case, uh, and she's, she's a white woman, a, a Dutch woman, um, she stages, she calls her work collaborations, right? With black, um, models, right, and Black artists and subjects. Uh, and then we have to ask ourselves, okay, is this Octavius Oakley again, right? Is this a white a, a white um, person, a white artist um, narrating, trying to narrate Black life and exoticize it, right? Or is it Black refusal or is it something in between, which brings up lots of questions around authorship and authenticity and appropriation around these um, stories of Black life and Black biography and history. Um, and then a brief, very briefly, um, there's a history of thinking about reappropriation in Black art. Betty Saar, who here reappropriates the Brooks slave ship print from 1781. Um, critics like Cheryl Finley, Celeste Marie Bernier, Helena Woodard, etc., have all thought about what um, Black British and Black American commemorations and even Black African, right, particularly Ghanaian commemorations of the past might look like um, that aren't portraitures in this case, right? Um, and then the work of Theophilus Marbo, Theo Marbo, um, who does this Instagram series called Echoes and Agreements. That's quite fascinating. Um, again, here we've got the Brooks slave ship next to a migrant ship. Um, from the contemporary moment, right, of Europe. Uh, and you've got the Vermeer portrait next to um, uh, African photography from mid-century, trying to have a direct conversation about writing back or rewriting, right, um, uh, the Black subject and the Black self. Um, and then um, Theo Eshetu, um uh, who and, and who is a, a, a British um, Ethiopian artist um, who works on a series, an installation called The Slave Ship in 2015 that riffs off um, Turner's The Slave Ship, but instead is completely abstracted, right? Making Black British history a visual abstraction rather than that of a figure. Um, so as you can see, they're, they're also um, aqueous, right? So thinking about um, uh, Black history, Black British history is both full of life and full of irrecoverable, unseen, or what Toni Morrison would call ineffable space, right? So playing with those dynamics in order to represent Black British history in particular. So wrapping up, um, I want to think about, this is an, another singular carte de visite photograph um, of uh, Sarah Forbes Bonetta, uh, also in the year of her marriage, but not her marriage photos. And this is another um, part of Heather Agipong's um, series, Agipong's series uh, on Bonetta. Um, so, Returning to this idea of critical fabulation, which is Sadia Hartman's idea of how we could move away from the archive um, and rewrite um, uh, Black history. 
I want to think about the remaking of the violence of the archive into something else, right? What what is that something else? If it's visual, that makes you see the archive differently, rather than the um, and and I want that to be rather than showing these contemporary works as being better than the older works, right? So doing a line of progression that says these old works were racist and these new works speak back. Well, yes, right? But what else can we find in the archive that exists? Um, when that something is visual, when you take away the plot and chronology of narrative, right, of that sort of teleology of biography, of what most of us do, which is write, uh, I write, right, that's my job, what do you have? Um, I argue that the visual history of Black Britain brings into focus the aesthetics of history, how we aestheticize history, uh, its forms and its feelings, the way capture is never fully capture, even as we can encode the ways that um, racist and colonial injury are happening in these pictures and the risks and pleasures and errancies of interpretation. And I, what Michael was saying earlier about feeling, right? Um, and the way music can evoke feeling in people and also learning one's own history in school and being seen can evoke feeling and that becomes important. I think that's significant here about what art has to say, right, about history. Um, I think of this a lot as uncertainty with more evidence, right? So I love historical evidence. I want to find more of it, but I also don't want that to stand in for certainty, right? An idea that now we've got it right and there's one accurate way to, to put it. Um, and that looking at Black British history through visual culture um, can um, can also offer an an obfuscation, sorry, of direct terms to ask the viewer to do the interpretive labor, um, maybe quietly, maybe internally, maybe unconsciously, to know that we won't all see the same thing or all get a single story of Black British history. Um, so that interpretive work that art makes you do might be um, another really valuable function to play with when we think about um, learning Black British history, teaching Black British history, um, and, and, and trying to visualize it and put that narrative out in the world. Thank you so much, Samantha. Um, that was fantastic. And um, I'm very much looking forward to hearing um, you speak more to those points in the Q&A. Um, and hello, Finn. Um, I would um, also now like to introduce to everybody um, Hannah Uzo, who is the artist um, of one of the portraits that um, Samantha presented to us. Um, the portrait is currently up at Osborne House. Um, so um, Hannah, if you'd like to um, come in and say hello and perhaps say a few words about your work, we'd very much well, like to welcome you. Unfortunately, for some reason, I can't seem to start my video. Um, so I'm afraid um, you have to just have a look at my avatar at the moment. Um, but lovely to be on this call. It's fantastic to um, to hear, Samantha, about your research and what you've done with, with Zara. It's really fascinating. Um, I started doing some research sometime last year on Black historical figures and came across Zara Forbes. Uh, David Olusoga had written a fantastic book about Black British history, and that was my starting point to my re my research. And um, oh, sorry, I just got a request to start my video. Um, sorry, not working. Sorry, not working. There, it's not still not working. Um, yes, so. Um, Yes, fascinating. Sarah's story is actually really, really incredibly fascinating. And since actually doing this portrait, I had the privilege of actually speaking to some of Sarah's descendants, which was brilliant as well to get a bit of family history about uh, some of the things that are not really well known. Um, but like you said, Samantha, the thing about the male gaze, I mean, there's a, in art, we talk about the male, the male gaze, the female gaze. And I think in painting Sarah standing like that, it was something that I wanted to change. The male, the having not the male gaze, but that female gaze, very strong, very bold. And speaking to, um, yes, a confident black woman, but at the same time, what is not, what you can't really see from photographs is that there's actually fabric on that painting. And immediately people see that painting, there's a bit of tension and anxiety by seeing such a beautifully painted uh, piece of artwork, but, with fabric on top of it. And that causes people to sort of be a bit anxious, you know, And but that's exactly what I was trying to allude to. All these questions that 
people have with regards to history, historical people, Black Victorians, and obviously Black Tudors, and, 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 and the, the list goes on. Um, so that's a bit of what I can say about, about, about the painting without taking the whole day. <laughs> Thank you ever so much, Hannah. Um, does anyone have um, a, a question at all, perhaps for Hannah, because I know she has to um, leave us shortly um, and soon we'll be we'll move over to Jeff's presentation. But perhaps, Hannah, if anyone would like to ask you a question before you go, Miranda. Sorry, Miranda. Miranda, it's so serendipitous and wonderful that you were here. Um, it's great. I'm sorry you have to go. Um, uh, I was really interested uh, with this connection with Osborne House because um, uh, I did a survey of English heritage properties a long time ago for links with um, enslavement and uh, the royal properties were excluded from the list of houses that I was meant to investigate. Uh, and then when they, uh, Madge Dresser and Andrew Hahn published The Slavery in the British Country House book, mm. uh, it was a really moving chapter by Caroline Bressy in which he mm. talks about the experience of visiting Kenwood mm. and Osborne House and knowing about these stories that were embedded there of Dido Elizabeth Bell and Sarah Forbes Bonetta, but, no, but not seeing that anywhere. Uh, so it's just a fantastic next chapter of the story to have this painting on display. Uh, my question <laughs> was, mm. uh, there's also there's a, a, an American academic called Brooke Newman who, mm -hmm currently writing a book about the royal family's entanglements with enslavement uh you know ever since Elizabeth I invested invested in John Hawkins's second voyage etc mm. I was just wondering what your take is on that and uh yeah what what, what your yes yeah. I think certainly we can't um diverse the, the the empire from its entanglement with the you know with the with enslavement and obviously with um with with what's happening in terms of all this unearthing of the um, the tides with you know with companies with with ships, um, but in terms of um, what what exactly was the point that you wanted me to touch on? Sorry, I'm not quite Sorry, clear. I suppose that. I mean you know the reparations campaign is mostly mm. targeted at the government, uh, but there's also have been efforts by uh, companies that. Have, are still in existence that benefited at the time and in a way the royal the royal family is an institution that mm. has uh, benefited from the profits of enslavement and what do you think they should do about it well I'd, well that's a very political question i think the royal family would definitely would not be coming up with an apology because once um there's talk of reparation and money is involved then it becomes very uh, a touchy subject we know that obviously the slave the, when the slave trade ended uh, the slave uh, the masters were given obviously some money for their losses um but obviously that didn't happen in in terms of it's not going to happen the other way around when the generations and generations of um of black people on the continent and currently here in the in the UK, who have, um, you know, as you could say, at loss financially, uh, whether or not the, the uh, whether or not the uh, royal family should say something publicly about it, um, I'm not too sure. But I'm I'm assuming that they are trying to use their uh, other bodies like English Heritage, you know, maybe the National Trust to maybe subjectively send messages of uh, yes, we're thinking about this, uh, but not necessarily. We're not going to necessarily come out straight up to say, "Oh, we apologise for you know for all the years of enslavement." Should there be something coming from the royal family? Possibly, it would be a great time for it because they've been silent. And as as you know, the 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 um, the there has been talk silence means consent. You know, it would be nice for the queen to say something in such at such a time as this. Um, but I am not sure whether or not I'm the best person to really you know, touch on that um, in terms of what exactly they should do. Yes, we should see some something from, from them perhaps, uh, but whether or not they will is 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 doubtful to be to be honest. I'm not so optimistic. Um, I think other bodies probably would um, like English Heritage or the National Trust and other bigger bodies are probably trying to save a bit of face by then doing these things 
that sort of allude to, yes, we are interested in black lives. Yes, we are interested in, you know, in changing the narrative. Um, but for us to go even deeper, if we were to take this, if we were to make this a really big deal, it would mean that obviously everything that the British empire has, you know, has, has done is, is on the back of slavery. Um, and so it's it's quite a bit of a, a, a challenging thing. And in terms of reparation, I mean, where where do we start from? You know, there's no collective in terms of a collective uh, nation or collective of people that you you know send this repatriation funds to. So I think it's a bit of, a bit of a touchy and difficult mm -hmm. one. Yeah, I think Daniel Coleman, who was with us this morning, uh, I don't think is here right now, but, um, you know, he, he's done a lot of work on, um, you know, reparations being more about, not not just about money, but about, you know, education and sort of advocacy and, and so many other things. I mean, one thing they could do, they've got loads of really interesting art in the Royal Art Collection that they could put a special exhibition on together. But, you know, I think they've just got such a uh, diplomatic role that they could play, mm -hmm. should they wish to, but I'm equally doubtful that anything is going to happen on this anytime soon. But um, I just wanted to hear your thoughts. <laughs> Thanks um, for that, Miriam. I have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Hannah, if you're good with us for, for another few minutes. Yeah. Um, so one question is um, from uh, Kesawa, John, and it's um, about how did um, Sarah Forbes Bonetta's descendants react to your work and how was it for you to meet them? And I think I understand from Iyamide Thomas um, from creos.com, who's also here with us today, that perhaps one of the descendants is actually here with us on the call. But Hannah, would you like to speak to that for a moment, please? Yes, so obviously uh, the painting caught a lot of media attention and one of, I think it's um, the great grandson of Sarah contacted me and we arranged um, the Zoom call with uh, the great grandson, Arnold Gordon and Adebayo Akunle, Ade, Adekunle Randall and, and Adebayo Randall. And we had a conversation um, regarding the work and it was, a, they really were positive, extremely positive about, about the work. And they were happy once again that uh, her story was being told. And it was also important for them because I think in, in most of the photos that are in, in the public display, um, the descendants are seemingly lost. But I think in the paint, in the, fo in the photograph um, with uh, Victoria and the two children, the son that is in that photo is actually um, a direct descendant of um, Adebayo Randall and Adekunle Randall who were on the call with me. So that was very, very fascinating. Um, and they were really, really positive about the way she was portrayed and that the fact that her story was now again in the public eye. Fantastic, thank you. And um, we have uh, one final question and that is from um, A. Pultney. Um, and it's about the, the dress actually that um, Sarah is wearing in one of the portraits. Um, but it's a question for both Samantha and Hannah. Um, is there anything else you can tell us about the choice design or material of the wedding dress? In, um, in terms of the detail of the fabric, I think Yamide had actually sent me some um, article regarding the look of it. It was, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was a silk dress. Um, Samantha may probably have more details on the exact um, on the exact fabric, but in my painting, obviously, I tried to speak to that by actually use, physically using fabric. But that was also a ploy, not only just to bring about this contention between a black woman in Victoria dress, but also just to create this this tension uh, between something that is um, something that's a painting, and yet there's a fabric on top of it, trying to move from. Uh, the past into contemporary art and speaking no it's not only to the past but in speaking to the future in, into in our current contemporary time the fabric is uh, transparent so you can see some of some of the fabric and you can see behind that fabric just to create that sen sense of layering in terms of um that this is a, a woman that has so many layers of identity to her life she was you know once a slave she was the also from not just a slave, she was a princess, twice a princess or twice royalty when she was in Africa. And obviously being in, in, around arist aristocracy here in, in England. Um, so speaking to those, those different layers of her life and different layers of identity, which I think for me resonates with me as somebody who's a black woman in England in this time, having those different kinds of identities. And generally I think black people where they find themselves, they have to 
put on so many layers of, of identity um, based on the circumstances and the situations they do find themselves in. And that causes a lot of tension as an individual, but also with the wider public. I, I imagine how, like Samantha alluded to, there were many other Black Victorians at that time, but in, in the sense, how were they living then? Maybe most of them were obviously, uh, you know, just maybe just free or, in, or enslaved or working in homes. You know, how was she perceived and how was she accepted? So it's, it, 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 it raises a lot of questions. And I think that's exactly what I want the painting to do when people actually see it. They see the painting, they see the fabric and they begin to ask questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, fantastic. Thank you, to Thank you so much. I just wanted to say that and also say that, Hannah, your use of your incorporation of textiles, now that I know that, is just phenomenal and I think speaks to the histories of reception of both women's art and African art that gets devalued because it uses textiles, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I just think it's wonderful. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. And um, I think um, your uh, point, Hannah, as well about, um, and Samantha, about sort of wider visibility um, of um, other Black Victorians also takes us now um, very neatly onto Jeff for our next presentation. Welcome, Jeff Bowersox from the University College London. Um, Jeff is Associate Professor in German History in the School of European Languages, Culture and Society at UCL. And he will be speaking on um, Josephine Morkashani a Briton performing black femininity on stages across Europe. Many thanks, Jeff, over to you. Thank you very much, Joanna. And thank you, Samantha and for Hannah. Um, I, think, um, I think there's a lot of material in the talk that I'm about to give um, that will have, uh, I mean, a lot of crossover in, in all kinds of ways, uh, femininity and fashion and visual analysis and so on. So um, without further ado, I'll just go ahead and get to it. Um, I'm just gonna try to share my screen here to make sure this works. Just one second here. All right. How has this worked? Is it shared? How are we doing? Has that been shared now? Let's see. I am now screen sharing. Hopefully you can all see that. Great. All right. Let me go ahead and begin then. Ladies and gentlemen, Allow me to introduce to you the star of our stage, the lady baritone, the fabulously fashioned, the eccentric extraordinaire. You'll know her as La Belle Creole. Please welcome Josephine Morkashani. Now, this is how an MC might have introduced the subject of my talk today, although he could well have done so in French or in German or in Dutch or in Danish or Swedish or Norwegian or Czech or Hungarian or Russian, because Josephine Morkashani was an extraordinary stage performer who dazzled audiences all across Europe and even farther afield to South and North America, to South Africa in a career that lasted from at least 1898 uh, into 1923. Um, she was born into destitution in North London and yet she became one of the top music hall stars of the era. And yet like so many popular entertainers, she has disappeared into obscurity. Her fame is as ephemeral as her undoubtedly captivating performances were. But thanks. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Yes. Can you hear me? We yes. can see your talk as opposed to your slides. Oh no. Well, that's sorry. Not right. Well, let me show you. Let me see if I can get that correct then. I was sure that I'd shared the right screen. Let me try again. So, so I think it looked like it that's was right. nested behind. There we go. Sorry to correct? interrupt. That's all right. How does it work? You still see it? Yes, we can. Okay, I was great. so taken with your fantastic introduction. I was sort of hypnotized. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let me carry on then. Sorry, now that you can see the screen. Um, so thanks to the efforts of genealogists, and not least of those are her descendants um, and relatives, um, for, from whom I've gotten many of these photographs and postcards. Um, also discographers and musicologists, uh, we can piece together the puzzle of her life and get a sense of the distinctive talents that made her such a draw at the time. Uh, but more broadly, I think we can use her experiences to see what it meant to be a popular entertainer at the dawn of the age of international mass commercial culture. Uh, we can also get a sense of what it meant to be a Black British entertainer at a time when African-American entertainments were first making their mark on popular culture, um, in Europe, I mean. Um, and what it meant to be a Black woman having to navigate racialized codes of feminine beauty and respectability. Now, um, I'm at the beginning of my research on Murkishani, um, part of a larger book project that I'll mention in a second. So this really is a work in progress. 
Um, but what I want to suggest is that we can see in her career the limits imposed upon her by racialized and gendered codes. Um, and more importantly, I want to, I want to follow um, scholars like Jana Brown and Louis Chudasokai and Astrid Kuser and others to tease out her very individual responses to those tensions, trying to, as she tried to work within these tensions, she tried to manipulate them or stretch them to her ultimate benefit. And as Samantha mentioned, not to sort of make her a hero or a victim, but to find how she's trying to manage under these circumstances. Um, and in that context, um, I'm gonna suggest that she built a career on shape-shifting, taking full advantage of the carnivalesque confusions of the music hall to craft a stage persona that frustrated easy definition. And she's living in tensions and gaps and confusions of popular entertainments and their unstable constructions of gender, race, and nation as powerful as those might be. Now, I'm gonna continue trying to share, just advance the screen. Has that worked all right? Okay, good, thanks. Um, Cause I am still reading on the screen. It's all very confusing, all this technology. Um, okay, so Morkashani's story needs to be set in the context of an international circulation of black and mostly African-American entertainers who are coming in large numbers from the 1890s onwards. And this is the subject of a larger book project um, now, I'm a German historian, and I'm focusing specifically on these entertainers in the German lands. Um, and you can see a link in the, the screen here to a website that I help run called BlackCentralEurope.com. And you can see the movements of these entertainers displayed in an interactive map, which you can go look at um, at your leisure. Um, but the broader point is that decades before the Jazz Age and Josephine Baker, African-American performers were crossing the Atlantic and making their presence known on music hall stages in the British Isles and all across the continent and beyond. Um, especially post-Civil War, in the 1860s and 70s, Black entertainers are being drawn into commercial entertainments in a variety of forms. Um, in minstrel comedy, for example, in ways they're going to feed into um, you know, ragtime and African-American popular dance, musical comedy and black, sort of Black Broadway. Um, and then also in the realm of uh, choral music, where you have a, an internationally known group like the Fist Jubilee Singers, who sort of invent the genre of the spiritual as uh, high-class art music, highly skilled, um, highly arranged um, music that was appealing to the sort of elevated classes and elites, um, um, and who were able to use that popularity to both present um, music that's understood as a sort of noble African-American folk tradition and also make political statements against white supremacy, even as their reception was still shaped by racialized uh, stereotypes. Now these two strands uh, between sort of minstrel and um, choral groups represent the poles between which African-American entertainers were suspended as they jumped across the Atlantic and then made a splash all across Europe, and especially from the 1890s. Um, and to summarize a very long story, by 1914, they're already a regular and popular presence on music hall programs across the continent, not just in Britain, but um, all across the continent. And middle-class Europeans in particular were crazy about music and dance associated with them. The cakewalk, the one-step, the two-step, the turkey trot, and all the various silly named dances that were the forebears of the more famous Charleston that comes a little bit later on. Um, in my larger work, I explore how these entertainers, who are mostly American, played with ideas of race and how audiences and viewers responded. And I'm arguing that in the, the back and forth between the performers and the audiences, we can see the production and the circulation and the contestation of ideas of race, nation, and culture. Now, chronologically speaking, Morkashani's career sits right in the middle of all this. But the fact that she's British at a moment when blackness is being increasingly shaped according to African-American models raises interesting questions about the marketability of particular sorts of blackness in the mass entertainment industry. And as we'll see, her ability to playfully inhabit a wide variety of forms while still leaning on a recognizably African-American tradition seemed to have been the keys to her success over a considerably long uh, career. Let's start trying to change the screen, there we go. Okay, so it's not clear how she got to the stage in the first place. Uh, she was born, Laura Fanny Josephine Steer in 1870 in Islington to parents who had only gotten married the month before. Um, her father was a cab, or, yeah, her father was a cabman. Her mother was the daughter of a cabman. And we know very little about her childhood except that she was sent to a boarding school, the Field Lane Industrial School in Hampstead, um, sometime before she was age 10. This is a school for destitute children um, that taught girls the sort of domestic skills they'd need for service 
and happy mothers as they grew up. And again, we don't know what our experiences were, but apparently the school was well run, but we can only speculate about what it was like at the school for. We know that age 21, she married Joseph Henry Highsmith, who's in the picture here with her. Uh, and he was a black man from Wilmington, North Carolina, who was a popular performer and a composer and may have been part of the Fisk Jubilee Singers when they went on tour. And this may be how he got to Britain in the first place, but again, we don't know. Um, they had a son named Joseph in 1894. They've been married for three years. And we know she was performing by 1898, which I'll mention in a second. And we know that she and Joseph split up under unknown circumstances by 1907, and he remarried and settled in Bradford. Um, Morkashani, for her part, goes a touring. And a lot of this touring she seems to have done with her son in tow. And as this chart suggests, she's touring all over Europe. Uh, she's touring in the UK regularly, but that's not where she starts, and it's not her performing base either. Uh, she seems to have had a base in Berlin for many years, up to 1915. And she goes, as I mentioned, as far as the US, South Africa, and South America. Um, her touring career around Europe stopped when the war broke out. She was stuck in Germany at that point. Um, and as a British subject, she's an enemy combatant. That puts her in trouble. But it's not clear the Germans knew that she was British, for reasons I'll address in a second. Um, but because she has an American husband, she was able to get an emergency passport. After a couple of months, she can escape to the Netherlands. And she settled there for the rest of her career uh, until 1923. And then she passed away in 1929 at the age of 59. OK, so that's her background. Let's talk about what, her, what she did, what was her act. And the central aspect of her act was her voice, which might be obvious for a singer. But what made her particularly distinctive was that she had a very deep baritone voice. It was a masculine voice that was all the more striking for the fact that she was a small woman, relatively, at five foot three. Uh, so what she would do is she would dress in men's outfits um, and then sing men's songs. Uh, one of these songs that she did over many years was uh, African-American composer Harry Freeman's 1902 romantic song, I'll Be Your Honey in the Springtime, where she sings about wooing a pretty little girl from Memphis um, who wants her to go ahead and earn money so they can get married. Um, so she's doing sort of straight sentimental songs as a man. But then she also takes on the character of a dandy who's made ridiculous by his pompous pretensions and inadequate command of elite respectability, which you'll see in the two left pictures here. Now in this, she's drawing on a common trope of a black dandy that found humor in the, like, the thinness of the veer, that veneer of, of civilization that David mentioned earlier in the day, um, used by whites in blackface, but also by black comedians. And like the black comedians who drew on this trope, it seems like Morkashani tried to undermine its demeaning aspects and make it into something else. And the reason I say this is because of the fact that she incorporated a laughing song into her act pretty regularly. Um, and like many of her songs, which are not written for her, but are versions of popular songs that exist, if this is modeled on George Johnson's 1897 hit laughing song, which many people try to imitate, then her lyrics and songs are about double laughter. So in George Johnson's song, it talks about passersby being ready to, to laugh at him as the dandy darky who falls short of all measures of respectability because he can't dance, he always says the wrong thing, he's got a gap to smile, he pretends to have royal ancestry and so on. But the singer's response is that it's all a show and it's all made up on the spot to please you audience. And the final line of the, of the song before the chorus is, now whether you think it's funny or quite a bit of chaff, why all I'm going to do is give this little laugh and the chorus is just laughter sung. So it's sung laughter that creates the tune, but all in laughs. Um, and you should look it up. I defy you to listen to it and not smile um, when you hear it. Um, but more importantly, the political message of it, it's that it's a wink at the artifice and improvisation of the performance. And there's an implication that the audience doesn't entirely get the joke. And for a white audience, that would probably be true when he's singing this in the US. Now, we don't know what Morkashani's version actually said, because we only have one surviving lyric from a promotional brochure, which is, I don't care, I'll always be happy till I die, which suggests that it could be along a similar sort of message. But again, that's half speculation, really. Um, but nevertheless, the way she's using these masculine sort of cross-dressing ideas is an example of picking up a trope and then sort of questioning it, keeping the audience off balance, using deceptions they can't quite tell what's real and not real. And this is a pretty common idea within music hall entertainment more generally. Okay, so that's not just voice and cross-dressing that she does, because she also happily switches over to play the role of the feminine diva, which is marked most notably by fabulous fashion. So as her billing suggests, 
um, she is La Belle Creole. She's the Creole beauty. And so she draws, draws on this trope of a Creole as a number of her competitors did. Now, among other things, um, the sort of mixed race Creole woman was a highly sexualized, fetishized trope by this period. Other things too, but this is the sort of idea within popular entertainments. And the idea is that being mixed race makes the Creole woman alluring. There's sufficient whiteness to suit mainstream conventions of feminine beauty, but this is combined with exoticism and an access to a sort of forbidden blackness, even legally forbidden you know, in the US, in parts of the US. But playing the role of the Creole, being mixed, means that Morkashani was a figure who straddled those boundaries and could thereby destabilize them. And this is a highly mutable category, which is, I think, how she plays the character um, of this, this beautiful diva. So she plays her as a diva. We see this over-the-top fashion that regularly drew sincere admiration from reviewers. It's bejeweled, it's sequined, there's lace everywhere, there's ostrich feathers. She adds veils sometimes to add a sort of, sort of um, vaguely orientalist flair to her stage name. And she could play the diva straight using sort of sentimental songs that your average soubrette would be singing on stage. But most often, and she's a skilled singer, so she can do this well, uh, but most often she plays the diva in a comic and ironic mode. She's a sharp-tongued stage presence who does comic dances and songs in these dresses and shoes. Um, she's doing um, popular dances and parodies of popular dances like the cakewalk. Um, we can see this, I think, in the character of the Dixie Queen that she used, which I'm pretty sure is the image on the right here, um, where we have an apparent parody of a Southern belle in this sort of fantastically antebellum dress, um, which is especially ironic because as a Black woman, she could never have been a Southern belle, right? Um, now, in these various playful modes, she never strays into the burlesque. Um, but to, to judge from reviews, she always maintained a certain respectability, which is an admirable thing um, for a woman who has sort of these sorts of challenges. How much do you stray into the sexualized and how much do you resist that? Um, and in fact, the only place where there's any suggestion of sexualization in her performances was, in, was when she's wearing male dress. Um, and she has a bit in the previous thing. Let's see there on the, let's see, can you see the screen? There it is. Can you see that back to the men's postcards? Um, in the left thing there, there's a suggestion that part of her act has some sort of rump shaking thing, a sort of bottom shaking at the audience in a sort of sexual way, which was entertaining to the mostly male reviewers who wrote about this, but they're obviously also discomfited by the prospect of a woman dressed as a man appealing to them in a sexual way. Right? This, this sort of confuses them in ways they found entertaining, um, but still there's, there's obvious tensions there. So what I'm suggesting is that by playing in a comic eccentric mode, she could draw in Creole tropes, but also call them into question to a certain extent. Um, and so as she's doing with Johnson's, as Johnson is doing in his laughing song, as, as the adaptation I think she's doing, she's playing with racialist, racial essentialisms, but also leaning very heavily on African-American versions of black authenticity. Um, so her Creoleness hints at this, um, but we see her sort of playing with different versions of blackness through her stage persona and the billing that was used in promotional material. So her first performances in Berlin in 1898, um, she was billed as the favorite singer and dancer of Ethiopia's Prince Menelik. Ethiopia's um, emperor was in the news a lot at the moment. And maybe this is just a bit too unbelievable because she didn't hold on to that one very long. Um, within a few months, she'd become Australian. Um, perhaps this seemed a bit more likely um, it gave her a sheen of exotic authenticity, but audiences wouldn't know many specifics about it, couldn't question it very much. But even as she claimed to be Australian, her repertoire is still based on African-American song and dance. When she first comes to the UK in 1902, she dropped the Australian bit, uh, maybe too many questions would be raised, and just claimed to be from the American South. And this was, un this was accepted unquestioningly by the British press, who just assumed that she'd never been to England before, even though she's from North London. Um, which is suggesting the complete erasure of her Britishness or her black Britishness anyway. Um, when she returned to the continent, she became Australian again. Even when in 1912 and 1913, she's touring with a, uh, another entertainer who was billed as her Sioux Indian. So she's an Australian with a Sioux Indian in buckskin and feathered headdress uh, doing African-American dances and songs. Um, it's, just, it's just a whole melange, it's, it's just a big mess, right? Um, that plays with all of these ideas that there's something essential to any of it. Uh, by the time she's in the Netherlands, after fleeing Germany in 1915, for the rest of her career, she simply claims to be from the American South. And by this point, she has the passport to prove it. She's just American. The Australian thing disappears entirely. 
Okay, so that's what she did. How was she received? Um, now, she was enormously successful right from the start. We can see this measured in a lot of ways. Um, theaters were often boasting them on how much, how expensive it was to bring her, to get her on the bill. Um, this was drawing crowds. And apparently in 1900, she was the highest paid entertainer in the Netherlands, which is something that was from a retrospective, a posthumous retrospective in 1930. Just a reviewer said, my gosh, did you even remember this person? But apparently she's the highest paid entertainer then. Um, and she was regularly the top bill. Uh, the top item on the bill. And this is true even when she shared a program with no less than Harry Houdini in Vienna in 1902. Um, and I've literally not found a single negative review and I've done extensive searches in many different countries, um, you know, digitized newspaper catalog, which are essential for doing this sort of work. Um, and this is an unusual thing that there aren't negative reviews. Usually any, every entertainer gets some bad press. Um, she doesn't seem to have much at all. What they do say instead is that she gets countless encores from rapturous audiences, and this is the norm. It's not a one-off. Regularly, she comes back out again and again and again and again until she has to be dragged off stage by the stage manager. Um, and this is especially true on the continent. But even though she was apparently quite a success, we can see something of the challenges that she faced as a Black entertainer, even given the gifted entertainer that she was. So we have a few reviewers who praised her in explicitly racialized terms, uh, demeaning terms, where they say, they talk about her as expressing the characteristics of her race, right? And this is meant to be a, a praise for them. Um, there are some who choose to interpret her eccentric humor in a minstrel frame. And this has particular perils for a female entertainer when beauty is the sort of main currency in stage entertainments. So a Vienna reviewer in 1902 describes her cross-dressing humor as unique exotic ugliness. And again, this is meant to be praise. This is not a criticism. Uh, but this sort of explicitly racialized commentary, unusually for a Black performer, was actually relatively rare. But in subtle ways, nevertheless, her status as a Black woman vis-a-vis -vis white women entertainers could be expressed through often unflattering comparisons, incidental and subtle comments. So she's occasionally juxtaposed with other white, with white female singers that are on the same bill. And the white singers would have their beauty highlighted, Hers treated either ironically or denied outright. Um, you know, another re Vienna reviewer describes her as being um, never going to be able to be counted among the beauties of the European variety stage, an offhand comment just in passing, while celebrating her as the forceful singer. Some of this, I think, comes from ideas of um, the associations of blackness and beauty and the sort of complications of a sort of Creole status. Some of it comes from the contortions of her act because she's actively breaking with the conventions of feminine beauty. And we can see this in a review from Copenhagen in 1910, when a reviewer praises um, the shapely and beautiful singer Lise Repair from Paris, who was on the bill, and also the grumpy Creole Morkashani, the comic force of the theater, a foul smelling rose, but a pleasure to watch. So again, the sort of, the sort of grotesqueness of a black woman engaging with conventions of beauty and then undermining those produces, I think, this sort of um, ambivalent response from reviewers, even when they're entertained. So I think that these sorts of responses, and I'll close with this, these sorts of responses uh, demonstrate the restrictions that she had to work within and the restrictions that she was actively trying to manipulate to her advantage. And her success at this is clear from a very long and successful career, um, comfortable enough that she could settle in Rotterdam in 1915 and live there taking care of her elderly father, performing whenever she felt like it occasionally, and then continuing to enjoy rave reviews from audiences that knew her very well. And suggested by the tributes that flowed into her, for a 1920 benefit concert that celebrated her career. She was a star with global potential who could have performed anywhere, but they were pleased she had chosen to stay there. And I think we can best appreciate the significance of her career and these complications by focusing on those choices that she was able to make in the broader context. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Jeff. Fantastic. Um, so um, I would like to, yes, thank you, round of applause. I would like to um, see if there is anyone with us who would like to put questions to uh, Samantha or Jeff, who, who uh, can now be in conversation um, before we've got, yeah, we've got about, um, right, I think we've got about 25 minutes, I think, Philip, before the roundup. Um, so I see a, a hand up there from Michael. Michael, would you like to put a question? Yeah, I've always got a question. Great, <laughs> um, right, that's what we so, like. <laughs> so I thought it was really interesting that all three presenters were talking about the figures 
in sort of, a, and I was I just wrote a note to Samantha about this, sort of an objectification of the figure. And I think that we're sort of um, fascinated with hero figures in our culture. And I think whenever we find someone, we have to put them in a box and make them mean something to us. And I, I'm, I'm curious about um, how, because I think Miranda did, did this quite well in her book, uh, demystifying the person and making them into just normal human beings. Um, and I think we have that quite a lot when we read biographies of someone, that it's always about how great they were. And we don't hear enough about how normal they were. And I think it's it's interesting because we have in in the in the sort of construct of racism, we always we also have the idea of exceptionalism. And exceptionalism is means that you can only belong to the group if you're exceptional and there are only a few of you who are exceptional so i think it's uh, if we can if either of you can address that that um issue or that question that would be great um i'm happy to jeff or you could go um you know, I'm obsessed with this question, uh, which is part of why I like wrote a whole book about these early celebrities and thinking about, again, these poles of tragedy and heroism. Um, and I call it exception and example that I think um, uh, public black figures are just uh, historical figures are marshaled into. Um, and I also am very I feel the risks of it too, right? The risks of of giving complex portraits of of um, of how much we need we need you know we need representation and heroes, right? We, we um, if that's the frame that the structure social structure exists in, and that um, you know that the educational industrial complex exists in like the national curriculum, right? There's this explosion of sequel books when she's in the national curriculum, as well as pushing back on her being in the curriculum. Um, but it's gotta, it's gotta take away so much of her, of her, her difficult history to do that. Right. And I think the same thing with Bonetta and these recovery projects. So this isn't an, an answer as much as it's, um, a, a sort of query about how those of us invested in anti-racist education uh, and history can find a way to risk the misinterpretation, right? Of giving fuller and complex and ordinary life to historical figures that I think so many that have spoken today do. Um, uh, and 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 thinking about what that risks entail, entails in in a in a racist culture in a racist state, right? Both I'm speaking of my own in the U.S., but certainly um, over there too. And so um, uh, this is something I just constantly wrestle with, and something that I also do think that these re-renderings, which is really what I'm obsessed with, how we keep returning to these figures, can do. They can kind of layer complexity. So I also think a lot about having multiple representations around um, whenever you teach these figures so you're not relying on the even if you're relying on the one figure which I hope we're not right that you're not relying on one figure and you're not relying on one book about that figure um, and that's where art or music or other representations of um, that kind of palimpsest representation of these figures that doesn't just rely on narrative um, can help, right? Uh, I've, I've, I'm sure you all find like my college students, uh, but also my children who are five and seven, who you met one, right, are really good at reading visual culture. They'll come up with really surprising things that aren't the main narrative. And so just trying, trying to layer those things and trying to give people tools, curricular tools that allow them to layer so that um, you could get multiple things uh, out of it and that things aren't erased. Uh, and I'm sure Jeff has a lot to say with that about sort of queer history and other things like that um, that are happening with what he's doing. Um, thank you, Michael. And thank you for your earlier comments about feeling, which I, I, I really wanna think a lot about our affective attachments to these folks, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have to admit that I find I find a figure like like uh, Morka Shani to be personally, I find her personally fascinating. Um, and on the level of sort of um, recovering figures who were seemingly prominent at the time, but have disappeared. I think there's value in 
um, without lionizing them, making sure that they just, we recognized that they had a prominence, you know, a sort of pre-Josephine Baker sort of figure who, she wasn't Josephine Baker, but she was nevertheless prominent for quite a long time and widely recognized as such. Um, and I, I, I feel the sort of tension because I want to celebrate her achievements. And I think she does have significant achievements. All the complexity is in those details we can't reach. It's in the sort of stuff where you need to be a novelist, right? It, it's, it's the gaps. Um, it's what happens when she goes off stage and talks to the audience. It's where her son is this whole time, right? Who's, you know, is, he ta is she taking care of him? Is he staying with her, with her parents? Entirely possible that she, he doesn't see her for six months at a time, right? Um, you know, what's her relationship with um, her ex-husband? You know, what is she doing on stage? When, you know, is, is she doing that laughing song like I think she could be doing? Um, or is she just making fun of black men? Right? It's, I can't really know because all I have are the postcards. So I think Samantha's right that trying to find the many different possible readings is the, and it's probably the best we can do at the moment. And I think as long as we can, your, your point is well put, that it's important to keep in mind the sort of normalcy of them. And in fact, I think there's a political, there's, it's, there's a powerful political potential in remembering that they are normal people, right? Um, that also means something. Um, and a lot of my other performers that I've that I uh, that I'm able to follow around um, Central Europe, you know, I learn I'm learning some unsavory things about them, right? Um, so and so was a womanizer. So and so, you know, uh, cheated in a contract dispute, and so on. Um, and I think those are also important to keep in mind, just so that we don't have this sort of flat, superficial picture um, about this. And I, I see Robert noting that there's a player musical to write about Josephine Morkshani. Um, I, I've been thinking a lot about that the last week and a half, actually. <laughs> so I think you're absolutely correct. And music would be great, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I think it's a great question, Michael, it really is. It's something that's at the front of my mind as I work on this stuff. I mean, that's, that's part of the problem of having so little information about people who were considered less important. I think mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the struggles that we have mm -hmm. um, as historians of, of, uh, of people of uh, otherness, if you will. Yeah. Well, I think that one of the potentials that in visual analysis is that where, because a lot of the, a lot of the, the resources that exist, the, the evidence that exists about these performers is not their voice. It's reviewers, mostly male and almost entirely white, um, and often very brief and not very detailed. And you can only get so much from it. You have to read between the lines. You got to read them against the grain. Whereas these postcards, you know, she wanted that postcard to look that way, right? that must be something that she wanted the public to see. And it may not have been who she was, but at least shows something about her public persona and the face she wanted to present. And that's true of lots of these performers who otherwise we know very little about. And so I think we can say something about the tensions at least between who they wanted to be and who society sort of insisted that they be. And then what they do in the middle is almost impossible to say with the tools we have at our disposal, at least for this period. Could I sort of come in on that and also say that I think in the educational context in schools I think that actually there's a real opportunity there for um, the teaching of Black British history to I suppose sort of just challenge perhaps some of the ways in which history can be taught because there are gaps because there are so many questions because the history is so fragmented um, and this idea of the ways in which um, artistic responses or creative writing can speak into those gaps. So I know Miranda, you've done some of that work um, alongside sort of Black Tudors in terms of those kind of provocations at the beginning of your chapters. Um, I was doing some of that work with the um, with autographs exhibition in a box with, for example, at photographs of Sarah Forbes Bonetta. So what what may feel like a, a, a challenge, um, I think, is is in many ways a kind of opportunity to um, encourage children, certainly in sort of primary, I think, primary and early secondary classrooms to start to develop a sense of historical inquiry um, because it's a very different process. If you're presented with a box of postcards or a, a set of images, as opposed to being presented with what might seem like a very monolithic narrative around the Victorians or the Second World War through a series of PowerPoint slides that kind of aim to tell you how it was.
Yvonne Sinclair, do you want to, would you like to come in on this? It looks like you have a response too in the chat. Hi there. I wasn't really wanting to add anything more, but just to, to say, um, it's always it's always difficult when you're looking at his, the histories of, of people um, whose stories are not usually told, where there is a gap in evidence. Um, we, we do end up highlighting, um, you know, the exceptional or you know the thing that was that, that is significantly different rather than the ordinary, um, because of the lack of you know lack of evidence. Similarly, for example, if you're looking at um, people from the working classes, let's say, um, it's, it's a similar story. The people who we actually have some evidence on, the types of evidence we have, is that evidence that is that could be described as being exceptional. Um, and I agree with you, Joanna, in terms of schools, you've got to ask questions about gaps and omissions in the history, different interpretations of the history, who's telling the story, what do we know, what don't we know, mm. and so on. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, uh, Jeff, uh, Samantha um, has put a question in the chat. Samantha, do you want to put your questions to Jeff about um, about uh, London, as opposed to us thinking about the Harlem Renaissance and Paris and those this kind of geographical question? Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, obviously, uh, all of your work uh, deals with this since you're looking at Central Europe at mm. the time, right? Um, but I mean, but we could also put North Africa on that map too, right? Um, so th the way that um, I would say my field in particular, African American studies, largely, right, sort of American inflected Black studies, has, has, you know, was always the Harlem Renaissance, and then diaspora was like, oh, but Paris too. Um, and you, the geographies you're mapping really seem to complicate that. And I guess I'm, I'm curious um, if you could just talk a little bit more about what that offers when you, I think you saw all of us light up when you said the, she was the highest paid performer in the <laughs> Netherlands. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And and we lit up both because it was interesting that she was the highest paid and probably because we don't always think about the Netherlands as a site for um, the circuit. Right. Of entertainment. Mm -hmm. I know folks like Jana Brown have talked about Germany and, and Tiffany Florval talks about Black Europe and all this other stuff. But can you tell us a little bit more about what that geography, what moving the geography offers us when we think about um, uh, Black identity of the time? Yeah, I mean. I mean, the, I was, the more I discover how broad this, this circuit actually runs, the more amazed I am by it. I mean, I mean, it, it, it reaches, uh, I, I don't, I don't find many entertainers from Spain, but it reaches from every corner of France all the way to Moscow um, and from Norway all the way down to Naples. You know, it, it's, it's, it covers the, almost the entirety of continental Europe. Um, and I think it, it tells us something about um, the sort of, transnational nature of this, right? The, and, and I mean that in the very trans sense that they're literally crossing every nation, right? And continually doing so um, and running into each other um, as they go. Um, so there, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a bar where black entertainers, and by this I mean African-American entertainers specifically, show up and hang out. There's a coffee house. Whenever you're in Hamburg, you go there and you always run into somebody, right? Um, and then you go on your circuits. And I've only done this for the German and Austrian lands um, in detail. Um, but this is not just Berlin and Hamburg, right? This is tiny towns. You know, the local city theater in, uh, you know, in Jena, in middle of Germany, right? This is not a global metropolis. And yet, um, on a regular basis, and not necessarily frequently, but on a regular basis, there are African-American entertainers coming through. And it's different ones, um, and they offer different aspects of African American experiences. But they're there, and they're visible, and they're running into people. They don't. It's not like you go on stage and then you disappear again. You talk to the audience. You hang out with them before. You have dinner with them after. Often, like there's a lot of there's a lot of give and take, and there's language barriers, but there's give and take. Um, and this says something, I think, about the the reach of an increasingly global African American popular culture. As, as export product, right? Um, and how I think this does change Europeans' perspectives on the, the wider world, on their place within the wider world. Um, and it also says something about what African-Americans are able to do and gather sort of resources for going back 
to do stuff in the US because most of them do go back to the US. Most of them aren't staying and they, they're welcome to listen if they'd like. Um, but they're, most, of them aren't, most of them aren't staying in Europe, right? Um, but some of them do. And so you get, you get new sort of diasporas um, that we don't really know about. Right? One guy named Edgar Jones who brings his wife over and stays in, you know, I'm not sure, exactly, I can't remember exactly where, but Northern Germany somewhere, has three kids who don't speak English, right? And he just lives there for the rest of his life. And one, I mean, one other point though, is that what it also tells us is about distinctions in black experiences, because I think as someone mentioned earlier, I forgot who it was, you know, the, the, these performers generally are writing back very positive experiences of their time in, in Europe. And they tell a story about Europe being a place relatively free of racism. And this is strategic, especially for black men, it's strategic, right? Because it's a way to oppose Europe, civilized Europe with backward brutal US. Um, even as they are having experiences, they just don't tell them about it. I find them in the newspapers. But it's not necessarily wrong. African-Americans had different experiences in Europe than did black Europeans. And by that, I mean native born black Europeans and more recent African migrants in the late 19th century. So it, it helps us um, diversify our sense of those black experiences. Um, again, all over Europe and not just in a few imperial metropole, metropolises. Um, so we've had some um, interesting uh, chats, um, thinking about uh, the uh, the power of the possibility of a musical play about Josephine Morkoshani and Josephine Baker. Um, <laughs> Josephine Ian and Josephine, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, Evelyn Dove. Um, I'm doing some research into Evelyn Dove at the moment because I recently discovered she is my auntie. So more on that in the future. <laughs> um, and uh, Michael has uh, asked about um, black classical composers um, in Central Europe, which perhaps you can speak to um, in a moment, Jeff. Perhaps uh, um, obviously, yes, we know of Samuel Coleridge Taylor in Britain and a few others, but any in Central Europe. Um, and Robert Gifford has asked um, of Josephine Mokoshani whether she had a manager, whether the theatres and music halls were managed by international companies. Um, so, um, yeah, can I put those questions to you? And then we've got uh, a few minutes and then at five o'clock, I think Philip's going to come in to make uh, closing comments. Great. Well, so as far as um, other cl uh, classical composers, I don't know of them. Um, it doesn't mean they're not there. The person who would know is Kira Thurman, um, who has a book coming out very, very soon called uh, Singing Like Germans. Um, I think it's coming out with Cornell, I think. Um, it's coming out very, very soon. Um, and if I'm looking at popular entertainers, she's looking at the high class entertainers. Um, so absolutely look for that. And she can tell you about this. Um, and it's especially about um, entertainers who are going to music colleges, music schools, um, for example, in the German lands. Um, and there are a few names that come to mind. There's one, uh, there's someone named Brindis de Sala. Um, there's a Cuban trio, two brothers and a father um, who are violinists who do a lot of circuiting tours in the 1870s or so, I think. Um, but she's the one who could tell you that sort of stuff in more detail because I'm dealing more with the variety stage. Um, Will Marion Cook goes, for example, the African-American. Yes. He, goes, he goes and spends time in Germany right, and writes stuff there. Um, but as far as say native born Germans and Austrians, that I'm less familiar with on a classical level. But again, Kira would know. Um, and I'm speaking only about 1914, post that there might be. Um, on managers, she definitely has an agent. Um, and the agent seems to have done work for her um, and also provided insulation because she was in a contract dispute and was charged a significant sum of money. Um, her defense was my agent made the contract out. I didn't know the details. Um, so she has an agent who manages those sorts of affairs, as most entertainers did. Um, I have his name, but I don't know who he is. Um, and the way the theaters worked, I think it's different per country. So in Britain, you seem to get on circuits um, with one big manager who makes sure you do all the empire theaters, for example. Um, whereas in Germany, you make individual contracts with each individual theater as you go, um, which I think takes a lot of work. Um, but, so if Morkashani wasn't doing her own work, other um, female entertainers were doing so. Um, and they were coming to Europe because it gave them a bit more freedom than they had in the US. Um, so I have other examples where that's being, that's the case, where that's happening. Um, and I don't know if, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll write the name in the text there, Michael. Um, I don't know if there was another question. I think I felt like I've missed a question. Um, I don't think you have actually. So you've told us about uh, managers and classical composers in Europe. Um, 
Any other comments or questions? Ah, oh, Pushpa. Um, Pushpa Parekh has asked, are there any connections between black entertainers and the Romani gypsies who are mm. highly racialized and stigmatized in Europe? Not in this period. So I'm, my research goes up to 1914. Um, I'm sort of staying away from jazz because jazz, is, it's, it's more studied, it's its own sort of thing. Um, so not in this period. In the 20s and 30s, yes. Um, and there are the, the I, I don't know many details of this, um, but there are uh, the jazz scene in Germany and Austria is one where African Americans and Black Germans and German Jews and um, so Django Reinhardt is a Hungarian. I think he has is he Sinti Romi connection? I think um, or at least Hungarian. I, I don't know the details, but it's a place where people who are otherwise marginalized within the mainstream power structures can find a place, and their sort of experiences of marginalization flows into their music. And jazz provides a sort of um, a sort of medium for articulating those experiences, that people find connection in their different sorts of marginalization through this sort of music. Um, so there definitely is. I don't know the details of it, though. Thank you. Um, Michael, yes, P possibly our final question yep. before we before we move on. Yes, let's go for it. One question, one more question for, for Samantha. Um, about intersectionality, for instance, you, you, a lot of your time was spent on talking about kind of the, um, the sexism, the misogyny in the naming of women um, from the ships. And, you know, so the, the women are having to deal with these, these two issues, amongst others, of, you know, the, the objectification from the point of view of being a woman and from the point of being um, uh, of another race. Can you talk about that just briefly, um, how you deal with that in a sort of clear manner? Um, thank you, and sorry, my house is obviously just totally crazy. Just, that's what it is. Um, uh, so thank you for that question, Michael, and you're just full of great questions. Uh, I think a lot about the particularities of, in, in that, acute case, and in the case of particularly Wheatley and Benetta, I think a lot about um, Black girlhood, and there's been a lot of work on Black girlhood studies to try to think about this, and that's like Robin Bernstein, Marsha Chatlin, Nazira Wright, these are some of the people working on it on the U.S. context, to try to think about the way that they're constructed as children, but also as um, objects, both sexualized and in this case, like not quite, like they're made into almost play objects. And obviously a lot of people talk about the figure of Topsy in um, Uncle Tom's Cabin with this instead of that. So I, I think a lot about that, but then I also think, and I think when Hannah was on and she was talking about the way, you know, visual pleasure and narr narrative cinema, right? The Laura Mulvey, the male gaze thing comes up, um, is that for um, black women and girls, it's not just about a desiring gaze, right? Sometimes it is about a sexualizing gaze. It's, um, I think about it a lot with Wheatley and her trial. It's a, it's a, a skeptical gaze, right? It's one that says sort of, what are you doing and why are you here, right? And also, um, how are we testing you, right? There's all this stuff about like kind of a trial. And so Wheatley, Wheatley's portrait, right, is her writing. Um, Bonetta's uh, makes sense. It's in the mode of her time. So I don't want to make exceptional claims about what her adult marriage portraits look like because those um, tend to hew towards what sort of other middle and upper class women were performing in their marriage portraits. Um, but certainly, um, certainly it's about sort of, uh, you know, needing to portray oneself as fitting into very particular um, gendered and feminine norms uh, that I also find interesting because they're also about um, the limits of you know, for lack of a better term, women's rights at the time. So with both Sarah Bartman and Sarah Forbes Bonetta, right? Um, Sarah Bartman, it, there's a big controversy and a big case over whether she could consent to her own performances. And the thing that fixes that is one of her captors slash um, 
uh, managers to speak of managers slash, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, employers, let's call it in, in the most, you know, least generous terms and probably more accurate to the most just had to marry her. And then it didn't matter about her consent, right? Because cover coverture, you know, took it away. And the same thing with Bonetta, right? So it was the narrative is she's saved from this, this evil king who of course Britain created through enriching him through the slave trade, right? Um, and then uh, she she's adopted by Queen Victoria and seems to have this life of great luxury even compared to many ordinary um, uh, uh, Black Londoners of the time, right, of the Victorian era. But, you know, she has to get married to keep sustaining herself. Basically, Queen Victoria says, like, I'm going to take away your allowance, right? You won't have something to live on. So like, that's the only way a middle class woman can survive. And it's, I mean, it's an interesting story about Phyllis Wheatley too. There's a lot of fights about how people view her um, eventual husband that I won't get into. Uh, but when she's no longer um, enslaved, uh, when, when she negotiates for her freedom, she has to get married because she, her doing domestic work, she's always been of frail health. She's been kind of um, treated as this exotic oddity, right? Who can um, read and speak and write in these multiple difficult languages, right? She's amazing. June Jordan calls her like the difficult miracle, right? Um, what is she going to do, right? In harsh New England as a free black woman, right? Her options are difficult domestic labor and or getting married. And she gets married and, and loses all of her children die in infancy. And then she dies quite young. Um, but there's not the room to move, even when someone like escapes bonds are, is so limited. And I would say the same about the sort of interpretive frame we could put people in. Um, and so much of it is about the intersection of sort of sexual and gendered identity and limits and um, as well as the, you know, on top of the the racial limits of the time. Um, so that was a somewhat inelegant way to talk about it. But I just did want to say that um, as my house explodes. So <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Samantha. Um, and thank you to um, Jeff. Thanks to both our speakers, well, to our three speakers, Hannah as well in her absence, who came on at short notice. And thank you, Samantha and Jeff, um, for welcoming her to the conversation too. But thank you for sharing such compelling research for us today and um, leading us in such a, um, an inspiring and invigorating discussion. I think that's a perfect place for us to wind up what's been a fantastic day. Um, I'm going to hand over to Philip, who's going to lead us into the closing comments um, and um, just say yeah thank you to everybody for contributing. Well, thank you Joanna for, for chairing it's, it was a wonderful final session I mean two, two, two great papers and uh, the, the end to a, a, a really wonderful day and so thank you thank you all for for taking part. Um, I'm just going to share something with you quickly. Um, I, I know that um, you know, in the in the cinema, if you can remember what they are, um, you, you tend to have the trailers at the beginning. Um, well, this is a trailer at the at the end uh, because we were we were so impressed by all, all of this, you know, submissions that we received for from our core paper papers that we we decided to hold a second workshop this term, which is going to be on Wednesday, the twenty fifth of November. And we'll, we'll put this up on our, our website and uh, registration is, is already open. But as you can see, again, we've got three uh, really substantial uh, panels. The first on education and public engagement uh, in, the, in the morning. And it, again, but the lovely thing is about this, about this format, we have people from uh, outside the UK, uh, from Germany, from uh, the United States, again. Um, and we also have people from outside the academy. So we have two 
uh, six form teachers presenting in the in the morning uh, on the 25th. So four papers on public engagement. We have a special paper on digital humanities and databases, which we're really excited about. And then uh, returning to, to art and culture uh, in the afternoon at four o'clock uh, with three pap papers looking at different aspects of, of that. So please do join us again. Um, and um, just to sort of um, bring in Miranda, um, that we had, um, we have a little message, don't we, from History Matters uh, to, to bring up, Miranda. I think you'll, do you want to unmute? Yeah, I've got a few kind of other trailers out there. Uh, yeah, so there's a, a group called History Matters that Hakeem Adi set up following a conference in 2015, which has been doing great work out of the University of Chichester. I think Kasoa, you're, you're Kasoa, you're, you're, um, you're, you've been involved with that at various points. Uh, and, you know, the broad, the broad thing is to try and get uh, more uh, young, young black students to pursue history to the highest level. It, the Young Historians Project has come out of that. Uh, anyway, they are launching a journal. Uh, the first volume is out now. Uh, I'll put a link to the website in uh, the chat in a second. Uh, and they are now looking for uh, submissions for the next journal, and the deadline for that is the 1st of December. Uh, and they're also setting up, where that book is now, they're also setting up um, uh, yeah, their second conference. So this was the publication that came out, which again has a chapter by Kessler that I uh, tweeted about earlier today. Uh, and um, they are now going to run their second conference in 2021. And I think the deadline for post of March. But again, I'll put those details in the chat in a minute. Um, I also, also wanted to briefly highlight that our sister institute, the Institute of Historical Research, um, has a Black British History seminar uh, that is on again this term, basically looking at education and uh, the second one in that series is tomorrow evening, and it's about um, Black British students' experiences at university. So, so that's worth looking at this month. Uh, breaking news is that it's just that um, this is going to be developed into a TV drama series by BritBox. So that's literally just been announced, so I'm excited about that. Yay! Uh, <laughs> Hi, Miranda. Uh, I, I missed part of that sentence. What? Which? What's going to be developed into a TV series? Black Tudors. Oh wow! Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yay! Um, anyways, so uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Also, you know, there's a, we've mentioned a lot of great new books today, uh, and uh, I would obviously encourage you to get them from your local bookseller rather than the A word. And um, most most local booksellers will be able to order things in and possibly even post them or deliver them to you now in these times of COVID. Uh, I was particularly told to mention Five Leaves Bookshop in Nottingham. It has signed copies of KD Cadden uh, Mason's book that they can post to you. Um, and uh, and uh, also, um, I've had a few comments in the chat. Um, you can uh, books and resources shared. And uh, Robert Gifford uh, would like would like somebody to put those all together. In fact, has kindly offered. I don't know if we can. You it has been in the chat um, and on the Twitter. So uh, I think. Well, anyway, if some me, uh, <laughs> then that would be great. Um, oh, and I think we should. Um, Michael Hojiri also put a lot of work into creating today's event and unfortunately wasn't able to join us today for personal reasons, but good personal reasons, not bad personal reasons. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so just sort of thanks to Michael in absentia as well. Yeah. 
And thanks to and thanks to Olga as always for helping to organise this event. And uh, thanks very much to to you, Miranda, and to Joanna who helped to put the program together. And uh, thanks again to our speakers, and and thanks to to everyone who's taken part. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next month on the on the twenty fifth. So stay safe and and see you then. Thank you very much. Are we, um, sorry, are we going to have um, a bit more Thank general you. concluded chat or is that it? We all have I enough. Think, I think <laughs> probably in that, I mean, your, your, um, your line is breaking up a little bit. So maybe we should, we should uh, cut our losses and um, call this a day. Oh, I'm on, my wrong, I'm on the wrong network. That's what's well, happening. Okay. Anyway, I'm going to stay on the call. Okay. All right. Well, thank thank you, everyone. I think we'll I think we'll <laughs> call it a day, and uh, see you see you in November. Bye bye.